Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Did you all see the remake of Beauty and the Beast? That Emma Watson's got some pipes on her, huh? She's just like a well-oiled car, in that there's certainly been a lot of auto-tuning. Good, good! I can feel your anger! The hate is swelling in you now! Regardless of your thoughts on this movie, it blows. Most people can agree that Emma Watson is no Paige O'Hara. I want adventure in the great white somewhere. I want adventure in the great white somewhere. But if she can't sing it better or in an entertainingly unique way, why sing it at all? This is not the first time in the past several years we've asked this question. Big name actors like The Rock, Emma Stone, Pierce Brosnan, and, I'm and of course, our darling little song crow, all have singing voices most people would agree are not that musically impressive. At least certainly not strong enough to survive in musical theater. For years though, this wasn't really seen as a problem as when an actor couldn't sing, they just dubbed them. Yeah, nobody even cared. If you could sing, great, but if not, you were still loved. You just got someone else to sing your part for you. But recently, there's been this big thing about not dubbing singers, even if they're not musically inclined. Because of that, our eardrums have paid with Gerard Butler, oh, the Marlon Brando, but there is room for doubt. Even Eastwood gave it a try, much to our everlasting horror. But suddenly my words reach someone else's ear. So the big question is, if an actor is not a good singer, should they be dubbed? Well, let's look at the pros and cons. The big argument is that if an actor is dubbed, it takes away from their performance. It's not the actor's inflections, tone, or even voice. So many would say we're not actually watching the actor. I'll admit there are times where an obvious dub can get in the way. Jonathan Taylor Thomas's sudden voice change in Lion King is pretty distracting. Well, when I'm king, that'll be the first thing to go. Gonna be the main event, like no king was before. But then again, Matthew Broderick's dubbing is almost identical. So many things to tell her, but how to make her see. Carrie Elway's dubbing is laughably noticeable in Quest for Camelot. Really? I'll have to take your word for that. Everything breathes, and I know each breath. But George Clooney's in Oh Brother War Thou has made the song a household favorite. I, am a man. I don't think that song would be as big a hit if George used his original vocals on that one. Nevertheless, I get the argument. When a dub is really obvious, it can take you out of the moment. But if an actor isn't a singer, why have them sing? Isn't that the whole reason we watch people to begin with, to see them do things that we can't? Gregory Peck is impressive because he's a better actor than most of the people in the audience. Audra McDonald is impressive because her singing range is incredible compared to anyone else most likely listening to her. Both create an emotional reaction with their gifts. Of course, there are some that can do both. Adina Menzel, Julie Andrews, Hugh Jackman, the list goes on, but not for an incredibly long time. Most can either act well and sing bad, or act bad and sing well. While star power is not quite as huge as it used to be in the past, it still counts for a lot in movies. And having a big name can, and usually does, bring a lot more people in. So the idea of putting in a big draw in a genre that's now becoming popular again is no big shock. But forcing them to be out of their element in a field where people spend years tuning their gifts seems pretty unfair. Now don't get me wrong, Hollywood is the land of unfair. But if someone can make you cry with this, This is the point of no return! And is being replaced with this, This is the point of no return! People are gonna notice. But there is something interesting that's happening with bad singers in film that sometimes could work in their favor. Having charm. Compare, for example, two bad singers in two different films. First, we have Russell Crowe from Les Mis. Lord, let me find him, that I may see him, safe behind bars. Next, we have The Rock from Moana. There's no need to pray, it's okay, you're welcome. Ha, I guess it's just my way of being me. Even though both of these voices are not especially great, The Rock sounded a lot better, didn't he? Look at how unfocused, uncomfortable, and uninterested Crow seems. 
He looks like he's more concerned about how to carry a tune rather than being a passionate character. The Rock, on the other hand, listen to his inflections, look at how he's animated, observe how 100% in the moment he is. What can I say except you're welcome for the tides, the sun, the sky. Despite both these two not being good singers, The Rock is having so much more fun and doing a much better job at sucking you in that it doesn't even really matter. Now let's switch it around. Let's have another Disney song with another Les Mis song. Anne Hathaway by no means has given the best rendition of I Dream the Dream. There are literally dozens of other recordings of singers with powerhouse voices who can do it a lot better. But her performance is engaging, gets you invested, makes you feel every ounce of pain this person has gone through. The dreams that cannot be And there are storms we cannot weather Compare this to the Beauty and the Beast remake, where poor Emma Watson sounds like she's reading notes in a recording studio rather than discovering her captor might have a redeemable humanity. Something sweet and almost kind But he was mean and he was coarse and unrefined It's so cold, lifeless, and robotic that of course we're gonna notice the flaws even more. As well as the technical corrections made afterwards. Now I know a lot of you really like this movie, so I will say this role can't be easy. Portraying Kristen Stewart, portraying Belle has to be difficult. <laughs> Good, good! Strike me down with all of your hatred and your journey towards the dark side will be complete! There's plenty of other actors who have won people over in a similar way despite them not having the most phenomenal voices. Johnny Depp's madness and Sweeney Todd distract enough people to get an Oscar nod. Emma Stone actually won an Oscar despite her singing being flawed yet beautifully vulnerable. And Disney once again helped Robin Williams' dazzling energy leap off the screen in this larger than life roller coaster. It's not great singing, but it's a great voice, and sometimes that's enough. And bizarrely enough, it can work both ways. In My Fair Lady, Audrey Hepburn is dubbed while Rex Harrison isn't, despite Hepburn obviously having a better voice than him. Lots of chocolate for me to eat. Lots of cow might not serve me. Hear a Yorkshireman or worse, hear a Cornishman converse, I'd rather hear a choir singing flat. But again, this isn't what was needed for the movie. Her musical sequences needed to be huge and grand, while his musical sequences need to be snarky and witty. His form of talk singing, as some people call it, works perfect for what's needed, while Hepburn's good but not great voice would have weakened what was needed in her scenes. I get words all day through, first from him, now from you. Is that all you blighters can do? I get words all day through, first from him, now from you. Is that all you blighters can do? Her voice is totally passable, but it's not huge, and this sequence needed a huge voice. So yes, there are times where a good singer needs to be replaced with a great one while a bad singer can just be kept bad. And surprisingly, they can both work. Sometimes though, it makes it worse. In The Fam of the Opera, Minnie Driver is dubbed despite the fact that she can sing, just not great like an opera singer, which was required for the role. Yet everyone else is allowed to use their real voices despite them obviously struggling like hell. Now not only do we have non-singers singing, but we have an actual professional singer to compare them to. That just makes things a million times more awful. So with all this going back and forth, what does it all amount to? Well, maybe some actors should be dubbed while other actors should be allowed to sing, depending on what's needed for the movie. If a non-singer can pull off the emotion of a scene stronger than a professional singer can, it makes sense to use them. If the emotion of the scene completely rests on how well the song is sung, it should probably go to the dubbing department. The Rock and Hathaway have emotional ups and downs that their vocal flaws can make more effective. It also gives more leeway to hide their weaknesses. Watson and Crow's short breaths and audio correcting can't be hidden as well in what's supposed to be a grand sweeping epic, so it would make sense then to dub them over. Especially when we have something to compare it to already. It just makes it that much harder to make it their own.
And to those saying that dubbing takes away from an actor's performance, I say it's like any other special effect. Some are done great, some are done poorly, but you still work with it to create an illusion that results in a strong emotion. It doesn't matter what means you use to get there or who did the most work, as long as the audience is engaged by what's going on. An actor doesn't insist they do their own special effects makeup, they leave that to the professionals. Yet they still have to act with it to suck the audience in. That's exactly how dubbing is supposed to work if it's done right. There's also no shame if someone's not a good singer. A playwright doesn't have to be an actor to get an emotional response. A special effects artist doesn't have to be a writer to suck somebody into a new world. So why would anyone expect an actor also has to be a singer to win an audience over? It's all an illusion anyway, and the better it dazzles, the more we forget we're just sitting in a seat watching a screen. We instead feel like we're being absorbed into a different environment. So, rather than letting poor actors like Pierce Brosnan Where are those happy days? They seem so hard to find Or Lee Marvin Wheels are made for rolling, mules are made to pack Embarrass themselves again, just remember, film is a collaborative art form. As long as the focus is taking people on an amazing journey, people are always ready to hear that music. No matter how it's done, or who sings it. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember, so you don't have to. Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out and this week we are doing the Waterkeeper Alliance. This is the world's fastest growing environmental movement, with more than 200 local waterkeepers patrolling rivers, lakes, and coastal waterways on six continents. Waterkeepers defend their communities against anyone who's tainted their right to clean water. They speak with a single, powerful voice as they tackle the world's most pressing water issues. The Alliance stands behind every waterkeeper, increasing their ability to function as community defenders in their efforts to protect the world's waterways. They support them by providing expertise in science, law, strategic planning, and communications, making them more effective in their communities, courtrooms, and classrooms. If you look at their site and their YouTube page, you can experience all the various ways that they help people get the clean water that they deserve. This is a great organization that deserves to get as much support as it can. So click on the link and see how you too can help millions of people drink safe.